All right, well, good morning. How would you like to sing Veggie Tales this morning? No, no way. It was hard to get you to do that last time. Who was, uh, who was still sleeping in uh, your costume on uh, Monday morning when we were all here for chapel? You're not going to raise your hand, are you? Okay. Well, it's great to be back. It's great to see you this morning. Uh, we're talking this week about movies, and on Monday we talked about making sense of the movies, talked about the concept of a Christian worldview in relationship to film, and about the concept of an, a noetic structure which has to do with everything you believe, why you believe those things, how the things that you believe are related to each other, and uh, whether or not you should believe those things. And we talked about how films challenge our beliefs through our emotions. This morning I want to talk about making sense at the movies by illustrating how belief is shaped to some degree through film. Just kick back for a moment, don't fall asleep, and uh, watch with me a couple of clips when uh, the, the time comes. Now, I want you to be thinking about this question. Are you good at believing the things that you believe? That's one of my favorite questions. In fact, in almost every presentation I do, whether it's in a Christian context, at a Christian university, or at a church, or at a secular university, whether it's a debate or whatever, whether I ask the audience this question or not, this is the question I really have for them. Are you good at believing the things you believe? Now there's a follow-up question, and that question is, does your life reflect the things you believe? If you're good at believing the things you believe, and you live in accordance with the things you believe, then you will have a good life. Seeing a movie is a worldview choice. Why? Because movies shape our views of the world. And so you're actually making a worldview choice by going to see a movie. It is a worldview decision. Here's our first clip. Now that's a bit of a long clip, but only three words are uttered in the whole thing. Let's go Sam. Actually, there's another word that's used, but it's very, it's an expletive early on in that clip. Right, so four words used in this little clip. I want to give you four or three reasons why I have shown you this clip to begin with this morning. First of all, this is an illustration of a movie that we call apocalyptic. Apocalyptic because it reflects, it's a representation of how things turn out in a very bleak way at the end of time. This is New York City. He drives through Times Square, and what do you see? You see remnants of human civilization, but everything is broken down, and time has passed, and you've got weeds growing up through the streets, and you've got what almost looks like the African savanna as he goes through with his hunting rifle trying to shoot an antelope. The antelope, the herds are running through the city. There's even a lioness who comes and takes away the prey. This is an image of the end of human civilization. Now, what I find interesting about this is that this is a very common theme in film today. You might not have seen the movie Children of Men. This was a few years ago, but it was another one just like it. It was a movie about how uh, uh, women were no longer able to have children, and so the last child had been born, and now they could only look upon the dwindling of human civilization as people got old and died out. Humanity would eventually disappear from the face of the earth, and the movie picks up from there. Why are we seeing movies like this today? We see the movies that we do today because of the way people perceive the conditions of the world today. And people are interested in these movies because they are curious about how things are going to end up and how we're going to be affected. This is a movie 
that depicts the end of civilization. It is apocalyptic. There's a book in the New Testament called the book of Revelation. In some translations of the Bible, it's called the apocalypse. Why? Because it talks about the end of civilization. Only it does so from God's point of view. The second reason why I wanted to show this clip is because of a little moment in the clip early on where there's a sign that you see as he's driving his red Mustang through the city. It says, Jesus still loves us. Now that is supposed to be ironic, isn't it? That is a message. Those are four words. And those four words are left lingering on the screen just long enough for the viewer to see what they say. Remember, this is a high-speed drive through the city. Things are flying by very quickly, but the camera lingers on the sign. There's a reason for that. It's drawing a contrast between the end of civilization and this old story, this old message that somebody had left up that says, Jesus still loves us. And of course, the question is, how can this be? This is not an accident. The director included that for a reason. It's part of the message of the movie. The third reason why I wanted to include this clip, and even though it's long, I wanted to go all the way through to where it shows I am edgened. I didn't know that it was going to turn out that way. <laughs> That's not a typo in the director's script. Is because of the significance of the title of the movie, I Am Legend. It takes almost, you have to go all the way through the movie to understand the point of that title. Why is it called I Am Legend? It's called that because, and I hope most of you have seen this movie and I'm not ruining anything for you. It's called that, cover your ears if I am, because this character played by Will Smith ends up becoming a kind of salvation, a savior, if you will, for civilization. And so his name will go down in history presumably as one who turned the tide of the decline of human civilization. I don't think I told you too much, if you haven't seen the movie, to go and appreciate how that turns out. And maybe if you have seen the movie and didn't really know why it was called I Am Legend, I've given you a clue that will help you with that. All right? And it may be, too, that you'll see why maybe the sign Jesus still loves us is not so ironic after all. That maybe that message is vindicated by the end of the movie. How about that thought? Now, Will Smith has trouble believing in God, and there's a scene in which he expresses this difficulty in believing in God. It looks like this, and uh, we will skip that scene. Next, I want to turn to another movie. Now, you might not have heard of this movie. It's a little-known movie called The Dark Knight, all right, with Heath Ledger and somebody named Christian Bale. Now, I'm not going to show you a clip of this movie. I'm sorry about that, but I have a feeling you already know this movie so well that the clips are already flying through your mind as we speak. Let me remind you by just showing you some sample movie posters to like make sure, is there a way to turn these two lights off up here and not any others? There we go, because this has to be the dark night. Right? The dark night. Now just look at these and ask the question, what does this poster say? What is the message of this poster? Now obviously, movie posters are fundamentally designed to uh, get you interested and get you to come to see the movie. But there's also a message and posters say different things. Ask yourself what each of these posters says. There's a close-up of the same one. Who is that?
Can you see what the Joker's holding up there? He's holding up a Joker card from a card deck, and what is the image on the Joker card? Batman, exactly. Who's this movie about? Is it about Batman? Or is it about the Joker? Or is it about both of them and somebody else? What's going on in this movie? I believe in Harvey Dent. This is another apocalyptic movie. The city of Gotham is a comical or cartoonish representation of the city of New York, right? The old comic books, Batman books, are really about New York City in decline. Crime is off the charts, nobody can be trusted, nobody is safe, and Batman is a normal human being with non-supernatural powers. I mean, he's not like Superman, he doesn't come from another planet, but he has great wealth. Bruce Wayne the real human being here, has terrific wealth and great determination motivated by his own witness of the killing in cold blood of his own parents. And so eventually after he grows up, he uses the, the Wayne fortune to develop technology that will enable him to fight crime in the city of Gotham. But it is almost daily, nightly, a losing battle. And this is what keeps the series going, is that there is a never-ending sequence of crime. And Batman will never really succeed in cleaning up the city. We know that. It's not going to happen. And so what he does is he just tries to carve out, inch by inch, a little bit more room for the light to come in. But it is a dark night. And so there's a double and tender with the name The Dark Knight. He is the dark knight, but he works in the night, in the dark. But it's dark all the time in the city of Gotham because it's the end of civilization. In this case, it's not because of the blowout of humanity from a disease. It's because of the disease of the human heart and criminal activity. And in the, human, uh, in the, in the Christian tradition, we understand the human predicament as a disease in both respects. There's the natural part of the human predicament that's natural evil, natural suffering, suffering, disease, and ultimately dying. But then there's also the human heart, the darkness of the human heart to contend with. And I think that movies today are showing us that even people with a completely secular mindset realize that we are hell-bent on our own destruction. And if we aren't, it's going to happen anyway. And it's beyond our control. But we want to believe there's a little bit of hope in there somewhere. And that's why the movie can be compelling and interesting for us. Maybe Batman will actually stop crime for a moment. Maybe he'll save a life. Now this particular movie, The Dark Knight, is an interesting development in the whole sequence of the Batman phenomenon. You know, when I was a kid and reading cartoon and comic books and so forth, Batman really wasn't such a complex figure. And you can be sure of that when you watch the old Batman TV show. You know, they could have called that Men in Tights, you know. <laughs> Batman, Men in Tights, with the pow and the punch and the ugh, you know, comic effect, to say the least. But the series began to get very serious with the development of film. And now we find that Batman is a deeply tormented soul. And that he's got his own demons to wrestle with on a much deeper level than was ever depicted in the cartoon series, or the comic book series, or the television series. And now, we're not even sure if the series is about Batman anymore. In fact, some people relate to the Joker more than they do the Batman. And the reason for that is because in this movie, strange as it may seem, 
the Joker is portrayed as a sympathetic figure. How? He's horrible. He's hideous. He's ugly to look at, and he does terrible things to other people. He's narcissistic. He doesn't care about anybody else. And he is the source of so much else that goes wrong in the city of Gotham. He is the epitome, the symbol of all that's wrong with civilization. And yet, somehow, we kind of, well, if we don't want to say it, but if we were honest, we, we kind of like him a little bit, at least, don't we? Why? Or do we? We like watching him. Does that mean we like him? No, that by itself doesn't mean that we like him. So maybe we don't like him. Maybe we were just curious about him. Maybe we're just interested in what he's going to do next. Maybe he just, the drama. You know, Keith, uh, Heath, <laughs> Heath Ledger did such an effective job portraying the Joker's role that we're just mesmerized by the artistry of his performance. Is that all it is that explains our sympathy, sympathy for the character? I don't think so. I think that the character, the Joker, was written into the script for this film, The Dark Knight, in order to be sympathetic. If you feel sympathy for the Joker, that's because you were supposed to. Directors make their films in order to accomplish certain effects, not just on the screen, up there in the theater, but on the screen of your soul. They want to accomplish, accomplish certain effects on the screen that is your own soul. And they want you to feel certain things. Let me back away from this movie for a moment and mention another movie that I saw. I, I don't even remember the name of it, to be honest with you. I saw it at... Uh, the Sundance Film Festival a few years ago. And the director was there talking about the film afterwards, and there were a lot of famous directors in the audience, actors, lots of people from the industry. There were hundreds of people there. They saw this movie. It was a very well done movie. And afterwards, the director was taking questions, but before he took any question, he said there a few, he made a few comments. And he said, one thing I'd like to mention about this film is that something happens with the audience during the screening of the movie, every single time, but I had no idea it was going to happen when I wrote the movie, when I wrote it and directed the film. And he said, there's a scene in there where everybody in the room laughs. And he said, the first time I screened this movie to a live audience and people laughed at that moment, it, it shocked me. I didn't even expect it. I didn't see it coming. And he said, that's just icing on the cake for a director if you're glad that they do it when they do. Now, sometimes when you're a speaker and people laugh, they're laughing at the wrong moment, you know, and you don't always appreciate it, so then you try to spin it like, well, you meant for that to be funny, right? But he was being very candid and saying, I didn't even try. That wasn't even intentional, but it turned out to be a good thing for the movie. Now, let me tell you the lesson I learned from that. The lesson I learned from that is that directors want to be in control of the emotions that you experience. And they expect to be able to engineer what you feel and how, how you feel and what even you think while you're watching one of their movies. And sometimes they're surprised by your reaction because it wasn't what they were trying for. And this was an exception to the rule Getting somebody to laugh when you weren't trying. The rule is they only laugh because you built laughter into the movie. You made, you made them laugh intentionally. Movies that have various features that surface various emotions in our lives do that for a good reason. They're intended. And so if you feel any sympathy at all for the Joker, that's not accidental. You are supposed to. 
Now, part of the reason why we might feel some sympathy for him is because we're concerned about the story of his life. We're, we're, we, we, we feel badly for him. We wonder why his face is so scarred. He tells a story at one point along the way that's supposed to explain it, but then it seems like he tells another story that's inconsistent, so he contradicts himself. So now we don't know whether we can believe him. For all we really know, he did this to himself. We really just don't know. But we now have this before us, this possibility that he was, once upon a time, a pretty decent guy who experienced some pretty awful things in his own life, and it turned him. And then we think, maybe we're sympathetic with him because we can see in ourselves some darkness and some propensity to do the wrong thing, and how we too could turn out the way we shouldn't. And so there's good and there's bad in everybody. And nobody is purely evil, not even the joker. Now that is a new message today. Once upon a time, there were clean-cut, clear heroes and clear-cut, not-so-clean-cut bad guys. In this movie now, we can, we can see that the Batman himself is a complex figure and there's darkness in his soul and we sense that within the soul, if he has a soul, the Joker is also not altogether bad. This leaves us with a confusing message about what it means to be a good person and what it means to be a bad person. This is a message of the film. This is a well-known film. Virtually everybody in this theater, <laughs> this theater has seen this movie and probably seen it more than once. Is there anybody here who could say, I've seen this movie at least three times? Clap your hands. <laughs> See what I mean? I kind of knew that was going to happen. All right, that was called engineering. All right? You see how easy it was for me to do that? You're being played when you go to a theater. It's not a bad thing. You actually go there for that to happen. You want to have an experience. But it's good for us as Christians to pay attention to the experiences we're having. Have you seen the movie Bruce Almighty? I thought I would close with a few comments about this film, Bruce Almighty. Bruce is a pretty ticked off guy. Now he's not like the Joker, although Bruce is played by Jim Carrey who has been in a Batman movie before, and he is something of a joker. And in a lot of his movies, he has this amazing capacity to just be wild and crazy and make us wonder, what kind of person can be like that? In this movie, he's a pretty normal guy. He's a, he works for a news company in the city of Buffalo, but he's at the bottom of the totem pole and he has aspirations to have a desk job where he's broadcasting in front of people on television instead of having to go out into the city and interview and do the kind of the, you know, pick up the crumbs, so to speak. And he does some things that gets himself fired. And from there, things go really downhill and he blames God. And he says that God is the reason why his life has gone wrong. And there is a scene where he has this fight with his girlfriend played by Jennifer Aniston. And she's trying to tell him, you can't blame God for this. This is your problem. And he doesn't believe it. He rejects it. And he gets in his car and he drives off. And ultimately he drives into a telephone post. No, it was a light post, I think. Light posts and such play a big role in Jim Carrey's life. It, plays a role in the early scene of a movie called The Truman Show as well. But he drives his car into this light post. He gets out. He's all upset. He's angry. He's frustrated. And he yells at God, and he defies God, and he says, Oh, mighty smiter, smite me. And you cringe if you're a Christian. You think, Oh, my gosh. I wonder what's going to happen next. You know, this guy is toast. And of course, nothing happens, and off he goes. But in due course, he has a little encounter with God, played by Morgan Freeman, a very unlikely representation of God. In fact, 
anybody is going to be an unlikely representation of God. If anybody is more unlikely, it's George Burns who played God in the movie Oh God, where John Denver had an appointment with God before he was killed in his own airplane crash. In that movie, though, I believe that we see some interesting themes that are corroborating of Christianity. And I want to close with this comment. When I was touring in Sweden a few years ago, I was giving lectures on the problem of evil at the University of Lund. And after the lectures, somebody stood up and asked this question. You tell me if this is a question. If I had God's power, I would not have created this world. That was his question. Those are the kinds of questions I get when I lecture at various universities. So I said, you know, I don't doubt that. I wouldn't disagree with you, and if I had God's power, I might have created a different world too. In fact, I shudder to think what kind of world you or I would come up with if we had God's power, but we didn't have God's knowledge. So I would like to ask you a question. What kind of world would you create if you had God's power and you had God's knowledge? And he sat down. Do you know why? Because the only way you could know what kind of world you would create if you were God is if you were God. And that is the message of the film, Bruce Almighty. Are you good at believing the things you believe? Part of being good at believing the things you believe is paying attention to the messages around you. And no message is more encompassing in a 90-minute time period than the message of a movie that has got you in its grip. Let me pray. Father, I pray for these students. I know how much you love each one. I pray that you would give them all that they need in terms of time and energy to make it through this semester and to finish well. I pray, Lord, that you would teach them that each time they expose themselves to a message in the dark, that it will also be a message where they can see your light and understand your message and its message in proper context. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. You're dismissed. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.